Okay, I've walked in with my beard. Apparently, I look just like Nigel Farage, according to Robert. So there we are. I won't tell you about my politics in that case. <sighs> well, we can come on to talking about the, uh, the EU a bit later, if you'd like. I'm quite happy to talk about the EU anytime you want, but get it right this time. Get it right, okay. Well, well why don't we start off with it now? What would oh dear, right, okay. You know, it's, uh, it's just two weeks and two days until the country goes to the polls. What would your advice be? Uh, get some information. Uh, I mean, what Cameron said, vote with your heart, didn't he? Uh, and one thing I learned in life was I love with my heart and for everything else I use my head. So um, I think we need to get the information if we to understand why we're doing what we're doing, uh, why we've got a referendum, what the facts are, what the consequences of leaving are, what the consequences of staying are, which are quite uh, interesting. Um, and I think then come up with your own um, decision. Uh, but the hardest thing is going to separate the bull from the shit. Um, and there's a lot of it out there at the moment, and which is which is a shame. Do you know what? I th was thinking on the way down here that if this referendum was the flotation of a public company, is anybody doing anything to do with business, commerce, finance, stock exchange? You got one. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> okay. Are you the rest of you thespians and scientists? Um, okay. Well. If you were floating a company and you had to do a prospectus, this referendum would fail on the first hurdle because you've got to verify everything that you say. And I'm afraid, which is, a, which is quite concerning, bear in mind these are the people that run this country, that they're prepared to say things without being able to verify them one way or another. So frightening, um, get as much information under your belt as possible. Uh, separate the bull from the ship, assuming everybody's lying to you, uh, and get them to verify what they're saying, and then make your decision. To, and it will be depending on how you want to lead your life. And when you've got those facts straight, how do you advise people to vote? Uh, strangely enough, if you go on my blog, theopathesis.com, um, look on my blog, um, I've been running, uh, I'm just writing the ninth one now, I've been running for the last eight weeks a blog, um, pissing everyone off, uh, pointing out the errors of their ways, um, and what they should be doing. Um, I'm not, I'm, I've got a theometer which runs on my blog and at the moment I'm a little bit towards Brexit, but only a little bit towards Brexit, but we've got a few more weeks to go, so we'll wait and see. Any two? Yeah, well, you know, I think it's going to be the most telling weeks. Uh, we had the Prime Minister out today calling, you know, the, 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 sec the, the, the Secretary of State for, uh, for Justice uh, a liar. How's he going to work with him afterwards? At best, they didn't really call him a liar. They used the word l -l -l liar because he wouldn't, would he? Um, he said he's saying untruths. Uh, so at best, he's incompetent if he's saying untruths. So can he work with him afterwards? Why would you have somebody in your cabinet that tells untruths? Well, will Cameron still be there leading a cabinet? Who knows? Well, if he loses, if he loses the campaign, undoubtedly he'd be gone. If he wins. He'll be there for a little bit because he'll still have to go because of the way he's dealt with the whole campaign and how badly he's performed on it. Mm. So if the referendum were to be tomorrow, you'd vote leave, the but you're willing to be swayed? No, no, the, the, the theoeometer is a little bit towards Brexit at the moment, but um, it's two weeks ago, everything to play for, um, and uh, I will make my decision close to time. What I'm trying not to do is to tell people to vote the way I want to vote. I'm, what I'm trying to do is to get people to vote, because it's a referendum, is to get people to vote the way they feel they need to vote, making their own decisions, but on the facts, not on scaremongering, on the fact there's going to be fire and brimstone, there'll be burning cities in Europe, and there'll be white graves and crosses everywhere um, if we leave the EU. Alternatively, there'll be utopia and everything will be sweetness and light if we leave because that's also utter bullshit because there will be the biggest shock this country has had since we left the ERM. Sounds like sensible advice. Of course somewhere else. I don't do sensible advice. <laughs> that's not sensible advice. It's just practical, logical advice. Sensible would be um, to go with the government and get knighthood or something like that. <laughs> oh, should I say that? It's fine, it's not being broadcast okay. for another week or so. We can try and leave it till after the referendum if you'd like. Uh, of course, somewhere else where there's everything to play for is in the den. 
and uh, you you were on uh, Dragon's Den for nine series. And did you enjoy being a dragon? I loved it. It was great fun. Uh, it was a bit daunting the first series because you're in front of cameras and that's not something that you know I'd had m m much experience of. Well, we talked about it upstairs. Um, I did have some experience. I was chairing a Millwall, so I spent a lot of time after the games talking to BBC News, trying to justify why well, we had so many problems. Um, but so that was about my only experience of cameras. Okay, so. but you weren't on the first series of Dragons there. No. Did you no. ever regret not being around? Uh, no, not really, because it was boring the first series. It only got interesting when I joined. <laughs> Correlation or causation? Um, I think it was pure coincidence. Pure coincidence. <laughs> okay, good to hear. Uh, well, you made 45 investments during the yeah. You did, according to Wikipedia, you did. Do you actually, sorry, I'm going to stop you there. Okay, who believes everything they're reading Wikipedia? Oh, fuck. Uh, come on, guys. Not everything that's on Wikipedia. Well, I study PPE. It's my main uh, source of <laughs> information. Okay. academic information. But it's true, of course. People do, don't they? I mean, it's got to be true. It's on Wikipedia, but some halfwit put it on there. And then some other halfwit can argue about, can argue about it. But for a period of time, it's fact. So is it not 45? I don't know. So it might be 45. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. Emily, look on Wikipedia now. For <laughs> goodness sake. <laughs> well, either way, you made lots of investments. <laughs> okay. And uh, I, th I think it was around five or six Somebody investments probably every counted them. Somebody probably sat there counting them. Yeah. Not there. And I added them up myself from yeah. series to series. You um, need to get a life, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, but of those, of those multitude of investments, which one was your favourite? Oh, wow. I've, I've had some great ones, but I've had really good fun. It, it, in fairness, the first series was um, uh, the idea, which is series two, was, was a bit nerve wracking and, you know, you were looking at everybody and trying to be very professional. And, and in those days, the dragons were really mean. They were sort of cast to be hard and business-like. And they showed you at the beginning of the show the credits, a, you know, a fast car, a big mansion, an aeroplane and a parachute, I don't know, a yacht. Um, and that was the whole picture of the dragons. Uh, it softened up as the series went on and the BBC realised they were breaking every editorial policy going. Um, but, um, so you, you were quite serious. So you were, you were choosing investments based on what you consider to be really good uh, business analysis. Uh, you very quickly worked out actually that um, a, a, a good person with an average idea was a far better investment than an absolute idiot with a brilliant idea, especially if you've got to work with them. So um, after the first series where we learned that uh, example, then it was really a lot of us just to invest in people we liked that had an average idea because we thought a really good person with an average idea is going to do a lot better than somebody who didn't have a work ethic, wasn't prepared to do their homework or listen with a good idea because otherwise you'd have to run their business for them and surprisingly we didn't have the time. So basically from, the second, from my second series onwards, apart, well there was one. I was going to say everyone I invested I was really ha happy with but there was one. What, your least favourite investment? Yeah, there was one. Which one was that? I don't know what we're going to say here, actually. Um, yeah, no one's going to know, are they? No. No. <laughs> You're not going to tell anybody, are you? No, if, I, if, I, if I name them live, is it YouTube you see going out on? <laughs> yeah, not live, though. Not live. No, no, live. no, no that's fine. It's recorded. Yeah. yeah. OK, so there was this bloke, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> we did the... Uh, one well, of the great things about BBC, they, they, they do try and join all their shows up with this sort of the family of the BBC. And the great thing about BBC, they, we, we did um, Comic Relief, we did Sports Relief, uh, Pudsey Bear. And there was a Sports Relief year, which is um, basically Comic Relief. Everyone knows what Comic Relief is, yeah? Comic, right, every other year it's Sports Relief. So we dressed the den up as a sort of football pitch. Um, and we had people pitching to us um, with products associated with sport. And it was a sports relief special, just 15 minutes. Um, and me and the tall fella, uh, Peter Jones, and he's tall, very, very, very tall. Weird, but tall. 
Um, we, we, we invested in uh, a bloke called Jean-Claude. Um, he had this, there wasn't apps in those days so much. Uh, iPhones, I think, had not even come out by then. Um, and it basically, it was like a Nokia phone, but it had all the peace maps on. And it could actually work out, so you took it with your skiing and it'd have all the peace maps, it works out your speed, where you've traveled, you could download it, really early stuff, visionary stuff. And we both saw it, we were interested in it, and I like gadgets. Anyway, we invested in it. Um, yeah, we invested in it. I remember all the profits were meant to go to charity for this one because it was uh, for sports relief. So we thought we'd be doing some good social enterprise. Profits going to charity. You didn't lose the charity money, did you? <laughs> we lost our money as well. Um, well, what happened when we completed, we were at lawyer's office, we did all the bits and pieces, and we shook hands, and we put all the shareholders agreement in place, which means you need another signature on the bank account. You couldn't spend money on capital more than 5,000 pounds without asking our approval first and everything else. All the sensible things you would do in a joint venture. And uh, then I left and went home. Tall fella left and went home. And Jean-Claude went to the bank, took the money and fucked off. So there was no, was there no gadget? This invention didn't really exist? No, it did exist. It did exist? He, but he just thought he'd spend the money. Okay. Which is not a good thing. So um, we found him in the end and um, he... Uh, Threw him off the top of the mountain. No, no, that was just our wish. No, no, so the, the, long arm, the long arm of the law took over. Okay. And he was tried, uh, proven guilty and um, spent uh, some time in... Um, her, Majest Her Majesty's pleasure. And uh, we renamed it to Jean Fraud uh, from that day onwards. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so that wasn't a great, good investment, um, all for the right reasons. And actually the product was good. I don't know why he did what he did uh, to this day. We don't know why, but he just fed false informa information that wasn't true. Uh, so we lost our money on that one. So it wasn't one of my, wasn't one of mine and uh, Tallfella's um, greatest hits. Okay. Do you have a, one that you have enjoyed with the tall fellow? Ah. So that is a good question. That is a really good we're, we're question. We're warming up now, I guess. We are, well, you're getting good at this, aren't you? Um, I've got lots with him, actually, in fairness. He's one of my favourite dragons. Um, and you'll get upset now, because I said he's one of my favourite dragons, favorite not my favourite dragon. He tweeted me the other day, and he got very upset. Um, but I've got loads with him. Uh, we've got quite a few really good ones. And actually, we've got another it was a much bigger company. We've got... Uh, Red Letter Days, which myself and Peter own 50-50, uh, which is really doing well. And we bought that from administration um, and it's grown brilliantly. It makes to about, just last year, over two million quid profit. So um, that was a nice little investment between us. So we don't mind that one. So yeah, so we've got some good investments. We're good, great mates as well, um, with lots of banter. Um, so yeah. Well, if he's not your favorite dragon, who is your favorite? I can't tell you now because you're, Filming it. It's not live. I keep saying it. It's not live, but it's <laughs> going to go out, and he'll get, he'll get really because he is tall and very manly, <laughs> but he's incredibly sensitive, aren't you, Peter? Really, really sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> so if I said, for instance, that Deborah might be my favourite, yeah, just, just for instance, you'd be very upset, Peter, wouldn't you? Yep. See, he's already very upset behind the screen. He'd be very upset. So I couldn't possibly tell well, you. Well, he better come here to respond. Yeah, we'll have to come and respond. But he's definitely up there, though. Okay. He's definitely up there. Good. Well, uh, Deborah, of course, was here last term. And one thing that she said in her event was that for a TV show, Dragon's Den is about as close as you can possibly get to real business. Would you agree with that? I think it's, it, it's, it's, it's that special. It's speed dating. That's it. Now, of course, you only see three or four minutes on TV. Um, a pitch can take several hours, but it gets edited down. Um, so even three or four hours to invest in a business is that mega speed dating. You know, so that's what it is. So what you're doing, you, you're dumbing everything down, keeping the, the, the raw ingredients of business, which is 
you know, what's the numbers? Will it make sense? Is there a market for it? Have we got enough cash? The management, all the things that you would be asking if you were looking at any other business. So you've got those raw parts of business dumbed down in a very short period of time. And then afterwards, there's some due diligence that goes on as well to make sure that what you've been told is true. Okay, so even after you've said, yes, I'm going to invest, yeah. that's not the end of the process? No, it's not. Because you could tell me, you've got this product, you've got a pattern on it, it exists, and then when we do my searches, it doesn't exist. Now, that would be foolhardy, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be. It would be. It would so, be. Um, assuming everything they've told, they've told us is correct, then of course the investment goes through. Okay. What's the worst pitch you've ever seen in the den? Oh, we've had some right rubbish ones, haven't we? We've had loads of rubbish ones. Um, I think the most rubbish one, really, really, really rubbish. There was, there was a couple of rubbish ones, actually, now I'm thinking about it. Um, there was one which is really early, series two or three. Um, some guy decided to invent a roller skates for your knees. Because you didn't see why you'd have to put them on your feet. Why wouldn't you put them on your knees? It'd be far more fun to actually have them on your knees and just roll around on your knees. <laughs> and when we asked him why, he said, it's great, I go there, I'll play with my children, I'm at the same height as them. <laughs> really? And he was like convinced. He, was, he started crying when we sort of explained to him, you know, articulately, slowly, and quite sensitively. Uh, well, some of us did. Some said, I'm all, I don't understand it, I'm all. Um, <laughs> but the rest of us sensitively explained to him that um, it, it was not a go at this one. And he got very, very upset. So it was him. And then the, the saddest one of all was uh, this lovely middle-aged lady, uh, twin set and pearls, um, came up the stairs and pitched very well spoken, articulate, I'd go as far as saying intelligent. And then I had to ask why. And she said she'd been on holiday once to Turkey. And she was on a budget, so she booked a cheap hotel. And then when she went to her room, shock, horror, there was a bath next to her room that she could use, so I said, that sounds good. But there was just a shower head off the taps and she couldn't have a proper shower because she'd have to hold a shower head while she was cleaning herself. And she thought that was a real inconvenience. And there must be a solution other than to bring for the bellboy to come and hold the shower head for you. Um, which would have been a far better idea if she'd done that, by the way. Um, and so she decided that this must be a better way. So she, when she got home, she spoke to her mother, her auntie, another relative, who also said she did hit on a really good idea. It's a real issue. It's a real issue, this, for all of us. So she spent £250,000 of her money, her mother's money, her auntie's money, uh, get into a prototype and patenting it all around the world of a piece of plastic which looks like a bar of soap with four stickers at the back of it that you can stick on the wall and then place a shower hose on it. So you can carry it around your suitcase with you, wherever you go. So if you find that the hotel you've booked is not up to scratch, and all it has is a hose attachment on the tabs, you just pull out your piece of plastic, lick the ends, stick it on the wall, <laughs> stick the shower head on, and you've got an instant shower. I think it sounds sensible. Yep. <laughs> Why? <laughs> 250,000 quid. And then she was devastated when we explained to her it had been cheaper for her to stay in better hotels uh, for the rest of her life. <laughs> uh, and um, she'd already spent the money. But 
would any of you spend your inheritance on that? There you have, that's because you all go to Oxford, that's why. If it was another uni down the road, they would, if it was Brooks or something like that, they'd be all on it. I would do it, I would do it. <laughs> I think There's no one from Brooks here, is there? <laughs> I think I'd have invested. Maybe that's why I'm not on Dragon's there. Yeah. Um, do you ever sit there in your, in your chair, or did you, and think, I wish I was up there pitching because I could do such a better job? Are you mad? No, it's my worst nightmare. You didn't have an idea that you'd want to pitch to the Dragons? No, I'd fight with them. No, no, it would be my worst possible nightmare. No. What, coming up against yourself? Any of them. No, 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 never crossed my mind. Okay. Not many better questions. Well, um, I was gonna just say, you know, it, it sounds like you, you clearly had a great time on the show. We did, we did. Throughout those nine series. So why did you leave in 2013? Because um, I'd done it for so long and they were changing over the format of the show as well. And it just felt right for me. And I just bought Robert Dyer's another business that needed turning around. We just started a new lingerie business called Boo. Uh, so work, work wise, heavy commitments to lose four weeks of your life plus all the ancillary aggravation afterwards of all the investments and everything else, was just, you know, there's a time comes when you think, you know what, it's been great, but I need to move on in life. Mm. And that, that was, it was the right time for me. Mm. Well, let's talk a bit about your, um, your businesses then, and how you made your 200 million fortune estimated in 2014. Where did you read that? That was also Wikipedia, I'm afraid. Oh, for goodness. <laughs> so, what is the point of going to the best university in the world and all your information comes from Wikipedia? I ask myself you every day. You might as well stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> you might as well just, where's home? Uh, London for me. London? Yeah. Well, there you go. You can enter the club, you'll be clubbing it, having fun, <laughs> jumping up and down. If you're inviting me, I'll come yeah, along. Yeah, now, of course, you're here and all your information from Wikipedia. <laughs> Well, anyway, of course, it all really started with, uh, with Ryman's, and um, I... It did not. <laughs> it so did not. <laughs> well, it started with the tuck shop when you were at school. It started with a kiss. Um, no one got that. Who got that? Uh, oh, another Bob Harris fan there. Uh, right, go on. Ryman, let's go take you back. We'll go forward a bit. Okay. Well, forward a bit. So, I mean, Ryman's, what is it that excites you about stationery? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> can I can I sort of turn that on its head? You can try. I can try. And and you had uh, the esteemed Sir uh, John Major mm. here recently, didn't you? Um, he did an interview why way 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 back. Uh, I think it was it was off, uh, shortly after he finished uh, being prime minister, um, and as part of his leisure activities. No, he didn't mention EC. Didn't mention her, but part of his leisure activities, he said, was going into Ryman and browsing stationery. See, he found it interesting. He's an exciting man. He's an exciting man. <laughs> um, and um, I just, it, it was when I bought the business, everyone thought, because it was in administration, everyone thought I was barking because the world of the paperless, 20 years ago, 21 years ago, the world of the paperless office had arrived and no one was going to buy any more paper, which is absolutely nonsense. And th they missed the point that Ryman was a convenience store. They didn't do that many, much contract stationery, uh, office stationery. For, it was really lastminute.com. You bought one thing, two things, and they're there for what you need them for, the convenience. And that convenience market, my, in my view, was always going to be be there even when we went through some most difficult recessions. And it's proven absolutely right. And in fact, we've seen the convenience model in supermarkets grow quite tremendously. Uh, it's been one of their biggest uh, earners. And, and the race for supermarkets to open convenience stores. So it was convenience, it just happened to be in a specialist sector, and that was stationary. And I didn't believe for one minute that we wouldn't be uh, using paper. And in fact, as it turned out, we use ink, ink huge amount of ink, huge amount of paper. We still like to print things out. We still like to write things. Um, and uh, we've seen some of our larger competitors, uh, like Staples, Office World, who had big sheds. And their view of stationery was, 
you would drive with the family on a Sunday afternoon, give up four or five hours of your weekend to go and browse and buy some stationery. Well, you're not going to, are you? You're going to pop in, grab something quickly and move on. And for, for me, it was, um, it was a calculated gamble. Uh, one that's paid off. Mm. You mentioned KISS, which I believe stands for Keep It Simple Stupid. Did I that say right? that? Did I say that? Yes. Oh, Wikipedia does know something. So. Aye. <laughs> um, so, and you know, you said that it's down to that mantra and just your common sense that you've achieved your success. What advice do you have for the budding entrepreneurs and business people here in this room? Okay, um, there'll be exceptions to this, obviously, but um, the old adage, uh, if it waddles like a duck, quacks like a duck, what do we know? It's likely to be a duck. A duck. So, that's apps common sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, on the blog about the EU, that's exactly what I've been... I've, 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 I've refused to get into the uh, claim and counterclaim about whether it's £300 million pounds a week or £150 million pounds a week, or this is going to happen, or the IMF have said, you know, we're going to melt a meltdown. Um, or the Treasury has said it's going to cost every household in the United Kingdom a trillion pounds on their mortgage, because it's all nonsense. Um, it's about logic. The whole EU debate is about logic. It's not just, it's not point arguing about the numbers. And business is, uh, it, it's the emperor's new clothes sort of syndrome. And business is no different. Start on logic and work from there. And over the period, logic will always end up ahead. You have some reversals, but it will end up ahead. And that's all I've done. My education was very limited because I was dyslexic. And um, at the time I went to a comprehensive school in North London where you, you were just stupid. Uh, dyslexia wasn't really recognised. Uh, it doesn't matter how bright you were, you were just troublesome because you would question, uh, excuse me miss, that doesn't make sense. Shut up and sit in the corner and you're troublesome. Um, so for me, the logic part was where I could see things and I could work things out and just say, if this happens, undoubtedly this is the next step and after that step, it's this step. And it's about keeping things incredibly simple. And then you pay other people to do the complicated things, uh, but keeping it absolutely simple. And do you think that entrepreneurship and that ability to use logic, keep it simple, is that something that can be taught or is it a kind of instinct that you're either born with or not born with? Uh, as an entrepreneur made or born? That's a question I'm, I've, I've heard many times before. I think the answer to that is, um, I've seen, I've changed my mind, by the way, you know, over the years. Um, because I've seen people who are not natural entrepreneurs do really, really well. So you wonder how. And I think the best analogy I can give you is uh, football. So you have a really gifted football player. Uh, and he ends up playing premiership football. And he's hugely gifted. You have a workman-like football player and he ends up playing in League One or conference. Both are professional football players. Both make money from playing football, just at different levels. So I think there's an opportunity for a large section of the population to be entrepreneurs but they won't all be premiership but they'll make a good living so does that mean you have to have some level of natural instinct but then you can train it and develop it i think you can, you can definitely train it and develop it and i think you can train um, for instance you can't be a football player if you can't run around the pitch so that's going to go out the window but as long as you can run around the pitch there's a level at which you can train mm. That's at a very basic level, of course. But that's what amazing. That, that's exactly <laughs> where I come from. That's great. Uh, but what do you make of the, all the big 
kind of business schools. Like here we have the Said Business School, SBS here at Oxford, which charges £50,000 for those taking its courses for, uh, for a single year. And obviously most of How many... £50,000. Wow. Many successful business people dropped out of school, didn't go to university. Do you think there's any point in having these business schools? Is it just a waste of money? Okay. Um, I'll, answer, uh, I'll answer that with another question. Um, how much uh, or GPD of the UK comes from small businesses? 50%. Exactly. Good, good. You've read that. Wikipedia. Wikipedia. 50% of the GDP comes from SMEs. Um, and that 50% is a magic figure because it's exactly the same figure, give or take one or two, I'm dumbing it down a bit, but give or take, I know I don't have to do that in this audience, but I'm going to do it anyway, just so I can do the numbers, otherwise it gets too complicated. But give me a couple of percent leeway when you look it up tomorrow. He's lying, it's 48%. Um, but that 50% is, is so roughly um, the n figure of businesses that fail in the first two years. So half of all businesses that started fail in the first two years. Uh, some restart again and go on to more, more success. Uh, some don't. And the reason they fail is the lack of understanding of business. Just the basics of business. Which is why I'm so keen about entrepreneurialism and business being taught really early on at school. Just the basics. So those, are, those that are entrepreneurial, at least have got some understanding about what they're going to be entrepreneurial about. And what, it's not just about buying something and going to selling it for more money. You know, that's a good start, but there's lots of things on the way if you're going to be successful that you've also got to do. Mm. Um, so I'm more keen about it being taught at schools, being taught to, to uh, even at junior schools, senior schools, unis, um, and making sure that people absolutely at different levels get that education because if we if we think about 50 percent of our gdp come from smes if we could be more successful in that failure rate and increase our growth rate it would have an amazing effect on the country mm. so um even though i didn't go to any formal uh education as far as business is concerned. I went to the University of Hard Knocks and it was painful. And I just wish, 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 wish that I could have stayed on just a little bit longer at school and had the subjects that I was interested in and learned the basics that I needed. And maybe that would been enough. Maybe I would have progressed and wanted to learn even more. Uh, so, I think that level of uh, education needs to go right across our whole, the whole spectrum of education, not just at the top end, where you've got <coughs> senior executives coming to be um, schooled. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how, what level you are in business, the bottom line is, is apart from the logical bit and do the basics that I talked about, is you've got to do your homework. You've got to know your products. You've got to know your market. You've got to know your business. You've got to do detail. And you've got to care. And if you're going to compete with everybody else, you better be sure that if you're going to compete, that you've got the, those cards stacked firmly in your favour. Now, that's not cheating. That is doing your homework, knowing more about what you're doing than the competition. If you know more than they know, you've got an advantage. You've got a better chance of success. I suppose that's a nice segue from one SBS, the side business school, to your own SBS, the Small Business Sunday Initiative that you started. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, I can. Um, Small Business Sunday. It, but basically, it's when I started in Twitter. Someone introduced me to Twitter. 
And I registered and all of a sudden I had 20,000 followers in like no time. I thought, whoopoo, whoa, whoa, this is good. And then I started tweeting, sending stupid messages and people were responding to me. I thought, God, I'm talking to 20,000 people. Uh, and then it reminded me um, about when I started off in business, so how hard it was and expensive to reach customers and to reach out to people, communicate with people. You used to have to pay for printing flyers, advertising, you know, posters, radio. I think, oh, this is good. I just, on my, on my phone, I just talk to them. I could probably sell them something. I thought, what a brilliant idea. Uh, but then I realised that actually, if, I, if it was me back in the early 80s, I probably would have about 200 followers. So actually, I couldn't get the same effect because I've only got a couple of hundred followers. In fact, I had 20,000 in two minutes because I've been on telly. Been on the TV, people want to follow you. So I thought, well, that'd be good. Um, why don't I share those followers with all those other businesses and give them an opportunity that I could never have and they could never have? Um, and it was on a Sunday. And Sunday for me, when I was in business, was, you know, after the kids got bath and put to bed, you know, I'd, I'd retired to the um, study. That's for the posh ones here. Uh, that have a study, or had a study in their home. Uh, study for, my, for me was a sort of a kitchen table. Um, so I'd retire to the kitchen table and prepare for Monday. Because I didn't want to go to work on Monday morning wondering what I was going to do. I was going to go to work Monday morning already pre-planned, hit the ground running get an advantage. That was always my mind, always get an advantage. Um, so that's on a Sunday. So I thought, well, I wonder if there's other people on Sunday planning about what they're going to do, small businesses, what they're going to do on Monday. And I started sending some tweets out. And then I thought, well, let's give them a leg up. And I said, first six that uh, send me a tweet back, I'll retweet you to my 20,000 followers in those days. And all of a sudden, all these tweets came back. So I chose six tweeted those and uh, I forgot all about it till the following week and then people started tweeting me said will you retweet me now it's Sunday I said oh yeah so I don't know there's a turn 100 200 300 and all of a sudden it got silly because like thousands would come through and as my followers went up as well um, and um, so we created this community small business Sunday so every Sunday people tweet me with their businesses um, I don't do it on a Sunday anymore because it would take too long. So it's done on a Monday. I've got somebody doing it on a Monday from the office where we go through all the tweets, pick out the interesting ones, a few criteria, and then retweet them on a Monday evening now, not on a Sunday, but they tweet on a Sunday yeah. between 5, 5 and 7.30. Um, and it's a way of really helping small businesses market. And that's become a community. They've got a website now. In fact, they've got an SBS shop now as well. So all those small businesses are working... Uh, you know, one man band, a lot, lot of women in uh, working from their kitchen tables around their families, creating crafts, small businesses. Um, and we put them all in the shop. So there's the SPS shops, so all their products are on there. So they've got a marketplace and the services are going on very soon. And we have a, 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 a get together once a year. Um, I don't know, how many turn up? I've forgotten now. Just over a thousand. About a thousand people turn up. Um, and we lay on other businesses to present to them, services for them, advantages, and we don't charge a penny. It's all free. It's amazing. It sounds like even in your spare time, you're always thinking about that next business venture and what you can do to connect people and generate revenue. Do you ever find time to just relax, take yeah, time off? Loads of it. Yeah. Yeah, I like to fish. Anybody fish here? It's you again. That's, that's, that's a lot of them common. Yeah, fishing. Um, the other, the other, the other, the other, other blood, 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 blood sport. We won't talk about that. Um, fishing and shooting. Um, cars, motor racing. Um, Spending time with Mrs. P. Oh, no. Don't do that. No, no, no. She doesn't know I'm here. Uh, she'd have a shock horror if I turned up at home. Um, sailing. So yeah, lo I've got loads and loads of hobbies. I, d I don't sit down. Um, I just like to do things. I just like, I've got itchy bum. I always want to be doing something. I just don't want to just sit down and vegetate. I always need to be doing something. Excellent. I think that would be a good time to open up to questions from the audience. And can we start off with a question from the gentleman in the aisle on the back row? 
Hi. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks, uh, firstly, for coming and giving your talk. Um, my name's Simon Lidicott, and as a person trying to start up a new business, <coughs> um, what, and I think you touched on it slightly as well with your, uh, your tweeting and everything, what do you find probably is the most effective form of marketing? E.g., do you now with obviously all the social media coming on and everything, do you still think the trade shows and stuff like that, so you've got the one-on-one -on -one person, is the best way to go? Because as you're aware, obviously, it's a startup business, putting adverts in costs thousands of pounds against a stand. I know it's a bit of a broad question. It is a broad question. I don't know what your business is either, and it's horses for courses, yeah. uh, is the answer. But cer cer certainly... Digital marketing has grown and come of age, no question now. And we see that in the results. The, the other thing about digital marketing is a, is a lot more targeted. Once upon a time, you'd advertise on television and 90% of the users were wasted because they weren't your client, they weren't your customer base. So they saw the ad, but they were never going to buy anything from you. Whereas with digital marketing, you can really target, which is quite important. Uh, and as users now become more and more comfortable with receiving digital marketing, every time you go on Facebook, you see the bar, surprisingly, it's, something, it's a website that you looked at recently. Yeah, you've been retargeted. Yep, you've all been retargeted. And you think, that's a coincidence. I looked at their site last week. It's no bloody coincidence. Um, so you really are focusing your spend to those consumers, just like, when you talked about a trade show. When you go to a trade show, you know everybody there is there in your market. Yeah. So you know you're not wasting. And there's a cost associated to it. And that's the thing. There's a, you've similarly got a cost associated if you go for a, beast, a, a, a niche magazine, I suppose, really, is the question. Is sometimes... Uh, I mean, what I'm sort of niche I'm magazine? What sort of business do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Not that type of business. So, uh, no, I develop um, bespoke software for engineering software in the oil and gas industry. Right. So it is very niche. So that's very niche. Um, I mean, I still find the trade shows, I suppose, more fun, to be honest, because you've got that interaction and that ability Well, it depends to on what the charge is to be there that cost you your time and your availability. But the fact is you're the best salesman in the world. Because if you've got passion for your business and you've written it, um, so, I, I, it's horses for courses and what industry you're in, to be honest with you. And experiment, you know, you know nothing stops you experimenting yeah. and just spending a small amount of money and seeing what the results are. Yeah. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the question from the lady on the front row. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask about what you think the role of social enterprise is going to be in the future of the business world, because obviously it's quite a buzzword at the I moment. I need you to, def we've had this conversation upstairs, I need you to define social enterprise. Okay, so a business that is set up to solve a social problem. A business that's just set up, well, okay, then how sustainable is that business? So it's not a charity, it's not a business that's kind of running on people donating money necessarily. So it has it's to be sustainable? It has to be sustainable, I yeah. I think that, that, that's, that's the $6 million question. Because uh, somebody asked me the question and I was, went straight in and said, no, nope, if you're going to have a business, have a commercial business, and when you've made a success and made loads of money from it, donate it every year to the charity of your cause. To me, that's philanthropy at its best, but you've got to think commercially. What I've seen is so many social enterprises start with all good intentions and actually it's not 50% that fail, it's a vast majority that fail, way above the average of a normal commercial business. So that tells you something's not right. Because I'm quick like that, I can work it out. And I think it's because although people have the passion for the business, for, for the cause, sorry, the passion for the cause, they haven't got the passion for the business. And one of my mantras that you probably find on Wikipedia, if I'm guessing right, um, the three reasons for going to work. 
And the first one is to make money. The second one is to have fun. And the third one, does anybody know? Don't forget to make bloody money. Because if you forget to make the bloody money, you're not going to have the fun. Because you won't have a business. <laughs> and that's what people forget. So the social enterprise, even if it's just a sustainable social enterprise, its first target should be sustainability. Mm -hmm. not, I know it's counterintuitive, not the enterprise itself. So even though it's a social enterprise, it's back to the money. Because unless it's got sustainability, it's never going to deliver. If it's not going to deliver, it's never going to succeed. So it's not going to, it's not going to achieve what it went to achieve. Okay. So it, it's a tough lesson and it's hard to, to get. And I've seen so many times you talk to people and they look at you as if you're some capitalist monster. <laughs> you know, no, I'm just talking common sense. You just won't be here to do the good things that you want to do unless you get this bit right first. So all great intentions, but it's the making of the money. If it's just sustainability, then it's the sustainability comes first. Thank you. Uh, if it's all about making money, you've made money both through turning around failing businesses, Diamonds, Red Letter Day, um, but also through investing in startups. Which is a better way to make money? Uh, it's, it's always for course. I've made money in, in so many different ways, but um, and I've lost money. By the way, I've lost absolute bundles. Anyone who tells you they haven't lost money is lying. Um, you invest, you lose money. You hope to get more right than wrong. Um, I, I get a particular buzz with working with people and uh, closely. So for me, it's always been the, the turnaround situation, actually getting down on the shop floor, talking to everybody, getting to know everybody, understanding the business and the silly decisions that previous management have, have made with the business. Um, and actually, all they had to do in the vast majority of the time is actually do exactly that, go down to the shop floor and ask. Because the answers are normally within its, the business itself. But sometimes people go to business schools and they just learn jargon. I actually haven't learned about business, they've learned jargon. It's worth 50,000 pounds. Uh, is it really 50,000 pounds? Yeah. God. I'm in the wrong business. But it includes free membership of the Oxford Union. Oh, so well, that's worth, worth it. Well, every, absolutely. If you'd have said that earlier, I wouldn't have been so shocked. Um, so um, it's, uh, it's about the information is there. In most businesses, the, if you're gonna, it's not finding the solution. If there's a problem, the biggest, prob the biggest difficulty is it's not, it's not finding the solution to the problem. It's finding what the problem is. Once you've found what the problem is, and I would say 90% of the cases, you'll find the solution. But you've got to find the real problem. If you don't find the real problem, you'll find a solution to something that's not the problem. And then you've wasted your time. And the way to do that is to talk to people. Thank you. We'll go back to, uh, to the audience. Question from the gentleman in the pink shirt. Hi there. I'd love to know what was going through you and your partner's heads when you were considering buying your first business from administration and why you thought, why you knew you could succeed when the previous owners had not. Just logic, common sense. So what, what did that look like for you? What, where well, you what, it look, you? It look, what it looked like for me was um, building blocks, just pure but I, I see things um, pretty clearly. I might be dyslexic, but uh, there's great advantages of being dyslexic. You find workarounds to most things to get you through the day, uh, whether you're a kid or whether you're an adult. And I, I see things in very small building blocks uh, and broken down in small building blocks. And then how those building blocks get put together to make the big block at the end of it. And for me, it's always a breaking down of a business into component parts. 
and in the reassembly, and whether some of the building blocks are actually required at all, or whether you need additional building blocks to actually make the whole thing work. Um, and I'm, I'm just thinking about if that what I was going to say is correct or not. I think it is. I don't think when we bought business out of admin that um, and if, no, no, none of them have failed at all. They've all gone on to be successful. Um, and it's looking why those businesses identifying to know about identifying the real problem uh, and not not hiring a consultant. Who's, who wants to be a consultant? And they leave here. Yeah, you're not brave enough to put your hands up, are you? You don't think twice about this. Um, most of you would be be offered jobs from consultancy companies because you've come from the right university. And you're obviously hugely bright. Not all of you. I've seen a couple uh, which, earlier, but one talk about them. I said, joke. I was only joking, for goodness sake. It's all going very quiet. Was it me? Um, joke. Um, but lots of people, you know, and I call consultants, you know, they borrow your watch to tell you, the to tell you the time. And that's what they do. They come into your business, talk to your staff, and then tell you what your staff thinking. Well, get off your flipping ass and go and talk to them yourself. Um, and that, and it's, it, I know I'm simplifying it, but it is that simple. You've got to be prepared to do it. And they'll tell you, once you've identified the problems, the real problems, then actually fixing them, putting them right, is not as hard as you think. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's not as hard as you think it is. So have confidence. If you can do that, if you can identify what the issues are, is your first challenge then finding a solution is a little bit, is probably is easier, it's definitely easier. Do you think buying through administration is an undervalued mechanism of entrepreneurship in society? No, because I'll start as well. I mean, we start, we've started businesses from scratch as well. Um, so, I'd say it's exciting, it's quite exciting, because it's a bit of rough and tumble, and it's a little bit dirty, and you're you know, down at your elbows with muck, so you really need to, it, it's, it doesn't last for long. I was going to say something else, I'm not going to. Um, that part of it is it, quite exciting. Um, it's the first phase, the first stage. It's actually, it's great, great fun. Um, and there's always a danger you're going to, I think the excitement is in the danger that you might fail, you might get it wrong. You can't afford to get it wrong. Um, and the adrenaline that flows from it and the period of that. Normally, the whole exercise from buying it would not be longer than a couple of weeks. And then the turnaround is in the first year. So all of that is quite fast. So I'd be lying if I didn't say, didn't get excited about it. And the fact that you get the energy, you're out of bed first thing in the morning, really excited because you, you can see the building blocks, you can see what's happening, you can see the results, you can see it's happening. Uh, and, you want to do the, and you want it quicker, and you want to do it quicker, and you want to go to the next stage quicker. So, yeah, this is, a, this is a different from a startup. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, go to the question uh, just next to you. What do you think of graduates that go into investment banking or consultancy? Don't ruin your life. <laughs> For goodness sake, you have one life. We were talking about that earlier, weren't we? One life. That is it. Very short it is. In the, in, in the overall scheme of mankind, it doesn't actually even... You know, you, don't, you, you won't show on the radar your life. Um, why waste it by doing something like that? Go into law instead. Oh, God. <laughs> I can, yeah. So, first thing, when you do that deal, the Lord, you're going to get up in the morning, you want to go in there, do that exciting thing the following day, all the things we just spoke about in business. Um, listen, you'll do what... Uh, I'll tell you what I said to my kids. I'm not joking with you at the moment, by the way. Is find your passion. Do what, you're, what excites you. What is going to make you jump out of bed. And if being a consultant does it for you, become a consultant. If being, going to, being, being a lawyer does it, become a lawyer. Because it's a short life. So do 
what excites you. Don't do just what's going to pay you the most money. You'll regret it. You might not early doors, but you will regret it. Um, do what, what your passion is, what drives you. Because if, you, if you've got a passion for something, and you can jump out of bed in the morning because you want to do more of it, surprisingly, the likelihood is you're going to be very good. And you're going to be very successful. And in a lot of cases, the financial rewards will come with it. But if you're going to do something just for the money, and sit in front of a screen, then unless that really rocks your boat, and some people it does, by the way, so it must do, I think. Um, if that really rocks your boat, then fine, do it. But otherwise, give thought, find a thing that rocks your boat, that's going to make you be excited about every single day of your life. And it sounds very cliche, doesn't it? Do you believe me? So if you had your career again, would you go straight into entrepreneurship? Um, I, I, I did, and without realising it, to be honest. I sort of stumbled into it more than anything else, um, because that's what excited me. And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I've done loads of other things that weren't quite entrepreneurial, but I probably would have made quite a bit of money in the other things as well, but they didn't do it for me. Didn't excite me, didn't really get me going. And I need that energy to, to, to keep me going. So, and I, I'm with my kids. They're all so, so different. Five of them, they're all so, so different. I can't tell you. And um, I've got one that works with me, who's entrepreneurial. The others have got no interest in being entrepreneurs. They've got careers in different worlds. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, if that's what excites them, that's what rocks their boat that's what they should be doing, irrespective of what academic results they may have or do or is irrelevant. It's basic. I think we've got time for maybe just one or two more quick questions. Quick questions? Quick questions. Keep the answers uh, short. We'll go to the question uh, from the member in the aisle towards the back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Has um, dyslexia given you an advantage in the business world? I think it has. I'm, all the way through school, it was, it was, it was trudgery. It was awful, my school. Um, only because I knew I wasn't stupid. And I could verbally reason with anybody. Uh, but when it came down to the written word, then there was an issue. Um, so I had a peer group that was academically in totally different classes to me. So I was in the bottom, they were like in the first, and there'd be three classes between us. But they were my peer group friends, not the kids I was in the class with. So some, there was a disconnect there. So for me to actually try and work through and try and get close to them and keep up with them, you know, I would have to work 10 times as hard. So I would have to prepare a lot more, do a lot more homework, put a lot more time aside just to keep up. I'd have to plan, I couldn't wing it. Bastards used to wing everything. Lastminute.com, and they'd be up there, and I think, how? They did no work, and they would just be there. I hated them because I would have want to be with them, but at the same time, I knew I had to go and prepare, and I'd have to find ways of dealing with things, working out different ways of remembering things, studying. So everything was a workaround. Everything was a workaround. And it took 10 times as long. So then you go into the business world and you find out there's a lot of lazy bastards out there that don't do the work. Whereas your cold work ethic was prepare, 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 work hard, 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 just to keep up. And then you find actually you didn't keep up anymore. You were ahead of the game. And I've got to tell you, that was a shock. I didn't expect that. No one told me that. But I was, was quite welcome. Thank you. And um, finally, we will go to the question from the gentleman here in the jacket. Um, so let's say you have nothing, you have uh, no business connection, you have no Twitter followers, uh, and you have £100,000. So what would you do? I've got nothing but a hundred grand. Yes. <laughs> Woo! Let's, let's say, I mean, <laughs> what kind of business would you Ecom. set up? Ecom. Um, people ask me, I mean, you try and recruit 
uh, even now, people say, well, what career, Mr. Profess, I don't know what career to do. And I always say, do follow your passion. Da, 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 da. Um, if you don't want to just make, if you, if you want to do something else, learn about e-com. Um, I mean, that's the, the biggest skill shortage at the moment in the United Kingdom, whenever you're trying to hire anybody, is in that sector. Because it's such a growing sector that you've got very average people who have got top jobs. They won't last for long because there are a lot of young kids now sh who are embarrassing the pants of them that are coming through. But because, because they were early adopters, they came, normally came out of the IT industry as opposed to the marketing selling industry. Um, so definitely I would go into e-com. Uh, for me, that's an opportunity that you don't actually need 100 grand for either. So if you'd have asked me the same question with saying you haven't got a lot of money, in fact, you've got very little money, I would still say the same thing. You'll see a whole load of e-com businesses spin up now in the next, next few hours. Taking my dinner. <laughs> Absolutely. Taking my dinner. <laughs> I'm afraid that's all we have time for this evening. Could you please remain in your seats and join me in thanking once again Theo Pafitas.